Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching today. I'm Dr. Linda Kramer and today I am honoured to be here with the amazing gentleman, Reverend Bill McDonald. Thank you so much for being my guest today, Bill. Where else would I be on any God-given day but to be in your presence? Come on. <laughs> oh, darling, you are amazing. <laughs> you know, I've been watching your work for a few years now, even even a decade ago, I'm pretty sure I actually did see your name around the traps. Um, I have watched your journey through your progressions of NDEs, OBEs, the healing that you do, the workshops that you do, the traveling that you do. You are such an amazing man doing their work. So basically today, I just want to talk to you about in a nutshell, I want to take the audience into these experiences. So I'm, I'm keen to actually just start at the beginning. How did this all start for you, Bill? About 25 lifetimes ago. No. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you start at some place where there's no beginning and there's no end? I mean, I, I truly believe that. Yeah. But we're each born into life. We're, we're not a blank slate that gets written on, we're already coming in with a story and we already have a personality and we already have certain vibrational and frequency levels within us that we've developed from previous lifetimes. So I truly believe that uh, everybody has, everybody is the potential God within us. It's all us. It's all me and you and we're all one. But yeah. in this dream world of life, that because we identify with the ego, which means we identify with our personal story. I am, therefore you have a story. And if, and if you have an I am story, then you have a body. And yeah. a human body or a astral body or a cosmic body or a body of light or a body, a rainbow body. If you have memory and a history and you identify with the self, the I, then you have a body. So, Interviewing me now, I got a body. You got a body. So we're subject to the, the cosmic material laws of having a life here. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked me when I was doing a, a radio interview in Belgrade, I think it was, about five years ago. The guy goes, well, obviously, uh, Reverend Bill, he goes, uh, you believe in reincarnation? And I go, I go, no. He goes, well, no, no, no. I, mean, I, I said, no. I said, I don't even believe in incarnation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no birth, no death. Therefore, there can't be a life. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There's no past lives. It's all now. It's just the one. And so, would, would you actually call that something like awareness or perception or even consciousness? Well, everything, it's all consciousness, but it's, mm. it's like a level where you surrender your personal boundaries of consciousness and you've melded with the consciousness. There's only one conscious universe, mm -hmm. God, love, light, whatever yeah. name you want to give it. But there's only one. As people say, what do you believe in, Reverend Bill? I go, I just believe in one. One what? No, one. That's it. There's only one. No time, no space, no heaven and hell and all this things outside of you. Everything is right here. It's all one. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, creates a, a dilemma because people say, well, you know, what would you tell somebody if they lost their child or somebody, you know, was in a war? Well, I tell people, if you have a body, then you're subjected to all the laws of this material world. Mm -hmm. And that includes pain, suffering, depression, joy, happiness, all these different variations of emotions. That's because you have a body, you've identified with this life, and uh, you haven't escaped. Mm -hmm. And really, escape is is really about expansion. It's about expanding your consciousness. So when somebody goes into a state of samadhi, and just for in case somebody doesn't know what that is, when you meditate, you reach a certain stage of meditation where you dissolve the personal ego, and you're aware of your presence in everything. Everything is you and you is everything and it's all one samadhi state. That's kind of simplifying it, but basically it's you've yeah. 
transitioned past the barriers of the ego. And when you're in that state, you realize there's nothing outside of you. It's all, it's all you. So when I'm doing my healing workshops, which by the way, just, I don't know when this is going to be shown, but uh, in the next three years, I will be in Australia. I will be, I, I will be taking these workshops there. Oh, honey, I would. I'm in Brisbane, so please put Brisbane on the map. I have so many people that would love to come and see you. So uh, the one thing that's holding me up is I just need sponsors there that would help me set up, you know, venues yeah. and stuff. Like that. But I, I originally had planned on uh, going on a three-year world tour. I mean, I've already been to India and Germany and some other places, but three-year world tour ending when I was seventy-seven. And then no more doing that now. And then take time instead of teaching individual people how to self-heal, I would take and teach teachers how to teach self-healing. Yes. And then and then when and then I'd take that group and find those that are professionals, practitioners of medicine, you know, uh, chiropractors, acupuncturists, mm -hmm. holistic yeah. medicines, various kinds, people that are doing that for their living. And then I'd have a special program for them and take them to the next level of actually yeah. certifying them to go out and do that. But right now, I found out as I was in India, I got more people that want to see me and, and, and get what I got than I could act, actually bring into a meeting room or a hall. I've mm -hmm. turned away crowds everywhere I go. Yeah, uh, I do best with a nice small little two dozen, three dozen people works really good on them. But uh, yeah. I got hundreds that want to come. And I realized that seven, eight billion people in the world, there's no way in the world I'm going to get the message out to everybody. I'm not that strong. I'm not that powerful. And my voice is never going to hold up. But I found out doing Zoom when the pandemic came and I couldn't go out and do all these things. I did some Zoom videos, which you probably have seen. Yep. And first year I did the Zoom, first year, first 12 months I did Zoom. I had a million people view my videos. I'm going, wow. how, oh, many, how, many, work, how you, many workshops would that have taken? I, you know? I love hearing this sort of story because a lot of people, you know, a lady came to me once and she had a stroke and she couldn't get to work anymore. But now that she's working from home, she's actually doubled her client base because she's now doing Zoom. So isn't this amazing that we're using this but like the spiritual or whatever you want to call it, the energy source, we're doing their work through the things that have been imposed on us in the last two years. So, Bill, I'm so proud of how you have adapted. Yes, that's amazing. So before yeah. we go into how yeah. you do your healing, I've got a question. Yeah. How old were you when you, in this lifetime, how old were you when you think you had your first NDE? Oh, I know when that happened. I was eight years old, but I was having out-of-body experiences and other experiences with spiritual beings. And, Way before that, yeah. And even alien beings, um, for lack of a different term. No, no, no. It's all good. <laughs> um, so there was never a time in my life that I don't consciously remember meditating, whether it was two years old, three years old, five. But uh, out of death, uh, uh, out of body experiences were common. That was happening to me nightly for my whole youth. But a, a near death experience is a whole different thing. Uh, and I explained that to the, you know, an out of body experience is a conscious process or unconscious process. Some people that happens to them, yes. they, they don't have control over it. But in my case, it was almost like a conscious process. And there's a couple ways to leave. Well, actually, there's about three ways to leave, but we'll talk about two of them. One is where you're attached to a cord. So you're leaving and you have this like silver cord attached, you know, it's, it's attached to you. Kind of like right. a, it, Can I stop you right there? Let's yeah. just talk about this cord, first of all. Yeah. You just said it was attached. So whereabouts to your, like, energetic body is it attached to? Or does it just come out of the whole of your essence? Nobody's ever asked me that question before. Um, 
I know I was attached to a cord. It have to be like an imbibable cord. What's that word? Imbibable cord? Like sort of around the belly button region? Yeah, that was that's what it felt like. But I didn't pay attention to it. So that's one way to, to leave your body. And then yep. there's the rainbow body, which we could talk about that experience where you just sap out your film of rainbow colors and you're gone. A uh, whole different evolving process. It's an expansion process. The, the normal out-of-body experiences, uh, you're attached to, you're still attached to the, the ego-centered body at some level, even okay. though you, so you can be thousands of miles away. I just want to stop you again. So yeah. you've got this cord going from your physical body that's asleep, and it goes to what I would call your energetic body that is out of your body. Okay? So okay. how... Please explain this cord further. And how is it attached to your body? Like, is it in the same region, like the belly button region? How thick is it? What does it look like? Um, can you All touch right. it? I'm gonna, I'm, gonna tell you, stuff. I'm gonna tell you a story because there's a witness to this, my wife. Good. Uh normal out-of-body experience. A normal out-of-body experience is an individual you having this. You drift around, you see things, you can't, you know, hey, nobody sees you, nobody hears you. It's like you come back, people think you're crazy. You know, yeah, sure you did. But this one, I was meditating three, four hours that night. My wife went downstairs because we were living in a townhouse upstairs. was was about 110 degrees upstairs. It was really hot in California. And she went downstairs, sleep on the couch. And, and I'm go- I was missing her. I was just like, you know, I'm laying there in bed thinking about her. And boom. I'm floating above my body with a cord attached to the body, the physical material body. And then I float through the wall and I float down the stairs. Feet aren't touching the ground or nothing. I just kind of float on down. And I go downstairs where my wife is laying, sleeping on a sofa. And she's woken up. She senses something and she sits up and she looks at her eyes, get like, you know, big, huge eyes. And she's looking at me and I drift across the room and then I sit on the on the, the end of the sofa. And when I do that, the sofa itself actually levitates about a foot and a half off the ground. I just move it wow. around. So she was getting scared when we were just married three, four months. <laughs> Welcome to the marriage. <laughs> yeah. So this was kind of a shock to her. Yeah. Anyway, of course. So she was like, I could see she was getting agitated and, you know, fearful. And so I looked at her and I said, whenever you need me, not when you want me, but whenever you need me, I'll be here. And then she got, so broke the broke the, the energy and boom, I'm back in my body about 2,000. You know, when you go back, it's like about 2,000 pounds. All of a sudden you got this weight, went from weightless to boom. Yep. And so the next day she gets up and she goes, my God, I had this terrible nightmare last night. And I said, no, you didn't. And I told her everything that happened. She goes, Oh, we must have had the same dream. I said, it wasn't the same dream. I said, this is what happened. Mm. She said, don't you ever do that to me again. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's one type of out-of-body experience. Mm-hmm. Then there's a third way, which is what I call two-body experience. And, and I could get into some stories on that, but let's just let, we, we say that for another day, but I've had experiences where I'm actually someplace else in a duplicate body doing things while the body's at home. Yeah. Uh, and had people witness it in different countries, cities, claim I was there, and et cetera, mm-hmm. including the police department the locally here. That's an interesting story. Okay, I'll tell you that story. Yes, please. It's, it's an oddball story. But it was, I'd slept, I'm like in this deep trance, uh, total dark, very out of its sleep. When I sleep, I sleep. It's trance-like. I don't remember nothing. I get up the next day and it's about six o'clock in the morning. Sun's coming up in California and uh, my phone rings. I'm sitting on the couch and the phone rings and I'm looking at the number and it's some police department. I'm going, what is this? So they call me at six in the morning. And so it's some spokeswoman for the police department. They were calling to thank me for the help that I gave uh, this man who turned himself in. They had this SWAT team surrounded his house for 17 hours. It was a siege. 
He was under siege for 17 hours. He killed one person oh. and there was shots exchanged. And then they waited him out. And then in early in the morning, he gave himself up and said, Reverend Bill talked him into giving up. And then the, and, and then and on the phone, they're saying, yeah, he was talking like you were here and everything. And I said, okay, fine. I, I didn't know what they were talking about. I had no idea what was going on. And anyway, the police department wants to thank you and blah, blah, blah. And we got your number from him and he wants to thank you for saving his life and wow. other lives. And I'm going, yeah, okay, it's a crazy call, right? So I hung up and I turned on the news and on the news about 10 miles away, uh, there was about a hundred police officers surrounding this house for 17 straight hours. Wow. And it was like, there was a big, they didn't want anybody else to get killed. They didn't want to kill him. He was an old Vietnam vet kind of going crazy because they were repossessing his house. They took his dogs from him. And I mean, oh he, was, he was divorced. His whole life was falling apart. So anyway, so I thought, wow. And then when I contacted people and I checked on the story and his lawyer and stuff and found out that, no, he believed I was there all night long with him. Police thought I must have been on the phone with him all night long because they didn't see me come and go. I mean, you know. Yeah. And, but he he told them that I was there with him all night long. So wow. that's one of, of probably three, four hundred stories. Uh, that one just has to be more dramatic and it made the newspaper. But so I kind of wondered about that. <clears throat> Why all these people would meet me and they say, no, I saw you. You were here. You did this. And so I had a question about that. And I went to a friend's house in Southern California and I was sleeping downstairs next to his master bedroom and it was sliding glass doors to his backyard. And it was like almost four o'clock in the morning. It was about three, quarter to four in the morning, four o'clock, something like that. What they call the Shiva hour. You know, it's like that mm -hmm. run that four o'clock in the morning is the greatest yeah. time to meditate. It's, and I look up, and I see a dark figure standing at the sliding glass door of the backyard. And the door is basically open except for a screen door. So the guy's opening the screen door. He's coming in. And I'm going, instead of being scared or something, I'm just looking at this guy going, huh. I, I thought, well, maybe my friend, maybe it's my friend he got kicked out of. His wife kicked him out. And he's, I had a king size bed. I was saying, maybe he's, this is weird. This is weird. But yeah. that's what I was thinking. But, you know, so I throw a pillow over there and I, I say, hey, stay over there. And I move all the way over to the edge. And all of a sudden, this body sits on the bed and it goes boom, 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 boom. And right into my spine. It's crashed into my back and there's like an explosion in my spinal cord. <sighs> Fireworks and electricity and sparks. And, and then there's nobody there. But it was like, I went to bed with the thought, how are all these people seeing me? Am I really going out someplace and coming back? That was a question I asked before I went to bed. Yeah. And then, and then at four o'clock in the morning, there's the me, the other body, coming back and going back into my spine. Wow. Uh, so that's another different type of out-of-body experience. Then there's the rainbow body experience. Then we'll talk about NDEs. Yeah. Rainbow body experience were super, super long meditation period, really long chanting, praying, all this stuff. And I took a picture of a Yogananda, Paramahansa Yogananda, the author of Autobiography of a Yogi, for those that have read it, which I'm sure that a lot of people in Australia have. Um, I stared at the picture. You know, when you stare at a, a spiritual picture, if you stare really not blinking, totally focused on it, it's like the eyes come alive, right? It's mm -hmm. like the face. It's watching you watch it, right? It's like yeah. alive. So it was kind of reaching that state, which, okay, that's no big deal at that point. It happens all the time, right? So I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden, boom, I'm leaving my body instantaneously. I'm in a film. I mean a film, just a film of rainbow colors, just like a rainbow, like somebody cut a piece of the rainbow, just whoosh, and this rainbow is zipping through like kind of like star trek when they go into warp drive <laughs> it's coming at you right yeah it's just going, and at the time i had the experience about 1972 or so so that's uh, maybe 73 so what's that 40 50 years ago 50 yeah. years i don't know, many years ago when i first had it and for the first 30 years of that experience i thought 
I was traveling at a high rate of speed because everything was coming at me. And, mm -hmm. and then I woke up one morning and I realized, wait a minute, the stuff was coming at me this way, but it was also coming at me this way, that way, and behind and up. It was coming all directions. So yeah. it wasn't travel. It was expansion. Wow. It was my consciousness expanding. So in other words, I'm growing this consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's encumbering all these things. And I was becoming one with everything I saw, everything I didn't see, everything I felt, everything I heard. And of course, the cosmic sound of the universe really, truly is. Om. Mm. It's just that humming sound. Yes. And that permeates everything that exists. It's just that humming sound. It's If you had a, a, a equipment and the ability to record atoms, you know, and molecules, the sound of them whooshing around is that sound. Wow. Thank you so much for explaining it like that. So the, so the sound of the universe that everybody talks about and why all the different religions, they go, ah, man, om, and oh. probably about 10 different sounds, but they're all trying to get that same level of conscious hearing, not a physical ear hearing, a conscious hearing. Anyway, so that experience lasted earth time, material world time, about an hour and 10 or 15 minutes. But mm. on the other side of me experiencing this where I was one with everything and I'm traveling the cosmos, literally not just the cosmos, whatever's beyond the cosmos. I'm talking creation and non-creation. It's just out there. Yeah. I was traveling 300 million years. I was seeing the beginning and the end of that 300 million year period. Wow. I could focus on anywhere I wanted on it from dinosaurs to Romans, you know, to, mm -hmm. to the future. It was all happening simultaneously. Yes. In this gap of non-existent time. <laughs> this, this, yeah. this thing. Anyway, so uh, that was a, uh, that we could do four hour show on sometime. But anyway, a lot of things <laughs> I learned, a lot of things happened. That's another way to travel. And I didn't fit that journey ended when I had an eye-ness, meaning the eye discovers itself again and has memory and history. I remembered I had a wife and kids. Boom, it was over. Boom, I'm back in my body, a dead weight woman. And I cried for hours. My wife didn't understand. Yeah. I just, I, 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 much as I love my wife, my children, I didn't, there's no way in the world I wanted to go back. It's, it's interesting that you just said it like that because when I had my NDE and I was in heaven, I was talking to my great, 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 great grandmother. And when she told me I had to come back, she said, think about where you were and you will go back there. So, you know, this is sort of like, you know, I like referring to movies so people can get relate to what we're talking about. In the end of The Wizard of Oz, where all she had to think of was home and she would go back to home. So it's good that you just explained it the way that you did, where you thought about your wife and kids and instantly that thought became your reality. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yep. yep. You're walking right back up to the material world. Mm. And it's like, you had a question at some point, uh, either on one of your talks, I've been watching some of your videos or something you wrote, you say, do we dream in heaven or something? Yeah. And I'm telling you, no, you dream here. Mm -hmm. This is not real. This is just a dream. Yeah. Even heaven is a dream. So do you dream? God is dreaming. And you are the creation of God's dream. And you've been, you've been given this illusion, this illusion of free will, because I'm still debating that. Uh, <laughs> you know, well, do we have a choice? Well, since everything ultimately is going back to the source, do you really have any other choice but to follow the flow of energy? It's mm -hmm. all taking us back. Yeah. It's like it's like you're a drop of water and you're you're in a river going down to the waterfall. Well, you know, eventually it's going to go to the ocean. You got no choice. Well, I got free will. I'm, I'm going to swim upstream. Yeah, okay. Eventually, you're all ending up in the ocean again. 
Yes. And eventually we all end up in the ocean of, of love and energy that is God. Yes. No matter how separate we think we are, like grains of sand on a beach, quadrillion times, you know, we think we're all these little things. And in essence, it's there's nothing outside of us. Yeah. Everything is God. Yes. And, and since we are God, everything is us. So there is no room for uh, pain and suffering because you're separated from that. But I have a body. You got a body. People watching this have a body. Mm -hmm. All those gurus walk around and got bodies. Teachers got bodies. All these people that are supposed to be enlightened souls all got bodies. Therefore, they have a connection with the I. They got a connection with the ego. They're yes. not perfect. They have to have some imperfections to keep that, to hold that body. Um, and so, therefore, everybody that has a body is subject to the laws of the body. Pain, suffering, mm -hmm. emotions, all these things. Yes. So, theoretically, and, and in moments when we're in samadhi states or states of bliss or whatever, we can jump out of that realm for periods of time. But to, to stay forever out of it, one has to become one with God again. Mm -hmm. You are. You, don't you, really, you, have you, to you have to wake up to it. Would you call that predestined events? Like, you know, people ask me a lot, do we have, is there fate, is there free will to change things? And I, I usually reply and say, yes, there are things in our life that are predestined, like you were just talking about with the water that always leads to the ocean. So what's your thoughts on predestined events compared to what we have as free will? Okay, first off, you have to realize your free will is in direct conflict sometimes with your free will or the government's free will or the dictator's free will or the doctor's free will or the germ's free will mm. uh, and world karma there's so much involved so you think you're in control but not so much and you also have this long dna strand of what i call spiritual dna in other words, all your previous lifetimes, nothing's gone and been forgotten. Mm. How you ate, how you lived, who you shafted, who you were nice to, who you loved, who you didn't love, who'd you fight, you know, what wars did you do, what kind of person. <laughs> yeah. All these things over millions and millions of years, God knows how many lifetimes, Yeah, uh, you retain that. And so... You think you're making a choice that's free will, but it's also dictated by your karma. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was in Vietnam, 1966 to 67, and I have some videos on this, so people want to watch them, but I knew who was going to get killed and who was going to get wounded. I knew what air airplanes were going to crash, what helicopters mm -hmm. were going down. And I tried to change things because I said, don't get on the helicopter, it's going to crash and burn, and, you know. Well, the military doesn't listen to you. <laughs> People go out and get killed anyway, even when you tell them yeah. this is what's going to happen. And it does happen. And yet they go out there anyway. Yeah. Not my destiny. I can, can kind of control my decisions. But other people, no, not at all. People think, well, but you can't control your children. You can't control your neighbor. You can't control. Okay. You're lucky if you can. Most people can't control their own self. Mm. Most people don't have the, the self-established awareness or the uh, self-discipline to make right choices for their greater good. Yeah. Therefore, they do drugs, they do alcohol, they overeat, they don't exercise, they eat terrible food, they make terrible relationships. I mean, the list goes on, right, of the negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also on the positive side, they meditate, they're exercising, they're, you know, they're great persons, relationships. But all that we do is karma, good or bad. Put any label on it you want. It's all karma. Mm -hmm. As long as you got karma desires, then you're going to keep being pulled back into the cycle. You're going to be on this wheel of life and death. Um, it's not just, well, I, I want to be enlightened. Well, that's you know, I want peace of mind. Those things are still karma. That's still things you want. That's still things you need to achieve. You're going to keep coming back to get those things. Yeah. So 
to become uh, to become this mindless person, soul that desires are dissolved, that the only thing you want to do is to love God, mm. serve. And whatever God wants you to do, great. You, you, you're, you're there and you're doing it. Yeah. But so I, I try to tell people, what, what did I do in my life? I'm, I, I don't know what I want to do. I want to do something that I enjoy doing. No. Mm. I want to live where I love. No, no, I want to. No, I tell people, it's not where you live and it's not what job you're doing. It's not any of these yeah. things. I tell people, love what you do. I don't care if you're a janitor, if you're a bartender, yeah. if you're a nuclear scientist. When you're doing your job, if you're working your job, but you're working for the man or the government or the company, then you're going to be miserable. But if you look at everything as service to the divine, then everything you do is like a puja, as they would say in India. Yes. So it's like a mass. It's like a, 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 yes. a worship service. It's like a Sunday, you know, in church. It's like everything you do, you're doing sacred it's a sacred measure of, of your respect for the universe it's yes. a measure of yourself so you don't have to go to church to be sacred and holy right. just mopping the floor cleaning the toilet cooking a meal serving other people being kind mm -hmm. all these things have done with your heart that's and right the of devotion and mm -hmm. everything is done for god even if you're serving a person you're serving the god in that person Take a personality out of it. You're serving God in that person. Yeah. Therefore, it's a service to God. So if you look at that and you go through life like that, you're going to have a whole different experience than somebody that's on this mundane plane and they just see, like, oh, do I have free will? Do I have free choice? Mm -hmm. uh, because then you get down to the ultimate question, which I have no answer for, but I'm just throwing it out. The ultimate question is, well, why did God create us? to tempt us with sex, to tempt us with drugs, to tempt us with all these things, mm -hmm. to test us if we love him? Come on. You know, I mean, what kind of guy? <laughs> what, God. So, or are we testing ourselves? <laughs> so it says it's all God. Yeah. It's got to be entertaining to God, but how entertaining to God could it be if, if yeah. you're in a concentration camp in World War II getting all your family killed? So it's, it's, it's one of those questions I, I can't answer. Is it destiny or fate? Well, everything that happens to you, you've created even though if you don't see it. So yes. in essence, it's your fate. That's like if you have your fortune told, uh, if you get what they call a, a naughty palm leaf reading done in India. I don't know if you've talked about that on your show before. No, I haven't. All right. 2,500 to 5,000 years ago, there was 18 of these rishis, great holy men. Yeah. Enlightened masters. And they meditated and they channeled, first real case of channeling that I could think of, but channeled information about people that were going to be coming into life in the future. And they wrote down this information on palm leaves. That's why it's called naughty palm leaf reading. Okay. Yep. Actual palm leaves. If you took the fronds off of it, you got a solid piece of kind of a wood there. Anyway, and they would have these scribes right on there and then shellac it so it would last a while. And people coming for 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years later, if they had one of these, they would seek it out. It would be found and they'd be given information. I've had it done twice. Wow. Uh, for example, here's how they do that. They... Uh, First time, I, first time I had it done was in 2010. I was staying at an ashram in, uh, outside of Pune, Pune, India. And the guru there goes, yeah, I want you to go to town and get a, a naughty palm leaf reading. And I'm going, I'm thinking, read my palm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm naughty. You know, what is this? <laughs> oh, you naughty palm. All right. So I had no idea what he was talking about. And I told him, I, don't. I said, I don't believe in fortune telling. He says, it's not fortune telling. It's it's your it's your future that's been designated for you to discover at this time. Wow. So he tells me a story about how they wrote him and channeled it and everything. I, said, I didn't want to go, but he ordered me to go. And uh, so I went there and and he, he says, You go to this place. Now, 
if you happen to have one of these palm leaves on you, there's about 20 places in India it could be. Uh, Pune is just one of the places. Chennai uh, in the southern part of India has another place. Delhi's got it. Uh, Mumbai's got it. I mean, they're spread out, so they're not all in one location. Yeah. So if you're looking for a palm leaf on yourself, what town do you go to? Yeah. <laughs> right? And then it's not filed by your name. Well, do you got the no, it's filed by a thumbprint. You give a thumbprint when you go to these places and they take your thumbprint. And that thumbprint, believe it or not, think about a star chart. If you get your astrology done, there's 12 zodiac signs. Oh. With the thumbprint, there's 108 different things you know this line 108 different things mm -hmm. types, types so you can break it into 108 categories but out of that you can have millions of these things so how do you break it down to the individual one that i don't know i got it broken down to 108 that i figured out so you give them a thumbprint and then they could spend six months or so looking for it and they come back to you well i didn't know that so i go there i give my thumbprint and i sit down I said, I'll wait. <laughs> the guru sent me right. So believe it or not, about six hours later, they had it. Wow. I, I the people that, that don't find it at all, or it's three months, six months, three weeks, two months. I mean, it's because they have to go to different places. If it's not here, they go to the next place. Yeah. The life. So you go into a room and they ask you about 40 questions. If any of the questions are no, they stop reading it. They set it aside. They take another one. So they come in. It looks like they're carrying a set of Venetian blinds. They're all these palms strung together with a cord. And so he went through about seven asking questions. And I'd say, no, nope. as soon as I say no, that was the end of it. On the seventh one, he goes, he says, intuitively, I know this is the one for you. I said, okay, you're not supposed to give me any information at all. Nothing. Yeah. So he goes, your name starts with four letters. I'm thinking, well, it's technically it's William, which is not four letters. Yeah. <clears throat> but I never, <clears throat> never, ever go by that. <clears throat> so it was Bill. And uh, <clears throat> so he says four letters. So I'm thinking, well, okay, four letters. Now, next to my thumbprint, they told me to put down an initial. And I put down W. I didn't put down B. I put W down. I, I, I'm, I don't want no Las Vegas tricks here, you know, mental sack or something. Right? Uh -huh. I'm, I gave him no clues, nothing. So he goes, four letters long, does it start with B? And I go, yes. And he says, Bill. I go, yeah. I think, well, maybe he overheard somebody talking to me. I thought, okay. Yeah. He says, and your father's name was exactly the same as yours was. Well, I'm William Hector McDonald Jr. My father's name was Senior, right? Yeah. So it's exactly, it said was, meaning he's dead, right? <clears throat> so he goes, and your mother's name starts with an M. I go, yeah. And then they murdered how they sounded, but they were correct. They were trying to say Marcella, but with an Indian accent and everything. It was, <laughs> you know, I figured, okay, yeah. so they spelled it out. Okay, yeah, Marcella. So they had my mother's name. They had my father's name. They had my name. Okay. Then he goes, and your wife's name is Carol. I go, oh, that's pretty good, right? Yeah, getting and good. So, so they go through about a whole bunch of these. And pretty soon he goes, he says, your birthday is March 16, 1946. And I'm going, well, it's a lot of guessing. I don't know. Do you look at me? Do I look like I was born? Do I look, do, do I look 77? Mm. Anyway, <laughs> so they made a pretty good guess. Okay, all right. I'm thinking, yeah. all right, they made a good guess. All right, okay. You know, you know, maybe they looked me up on the internet or something. Then he goes, he goes, says, but we're having trouble with the time of your birth. I go, oh, okay, all right. He says, he says, between 110 and 120, 130, someplace right in there. And what they didn't know was when I was born, the doctor wasn't there and the nurses tried to keep me from being fully born. And, and I'm, that's a whole story. Uh, when the doctor got there, they took a guess on my time. They guess well between 120 and 125, you know. Yeah. And so they, they took a guess at the time. So in this reading, they didn't know the exact time and took a guess. And it was the same guess that was on my birth certificate. Yeah. 
And the birth certificate is a guess. The doctor made the best guess, you know, from the situation. Yeah. So, and then they went through, they go, you write books. Yeah. You're a lover of Lord Shiva. And I didn't know how to answer that because at that time I had no clue what any of that was about. And he goes, uh -huh. just, he goes take our word for it. You are? I said, okay, great. Um, and, and, and just one thing. And then pretty soon I thought that was it. I mean, it was like 40 things. You know, you got a boy, you got a girl in that order, blah, blah, blah. And you, and, and, and told me my occupation and all this stuff. And so I was getting ready to pay the guy for the reading. I thought that's really stupid. And told me everything I know. But <laughs> I could have told myself that. Yeah. So he goes, oh, no, no, that's not your reading. He says, we're going to do your chart now. Yep. So about six hours later, I'm taken upstairs and they do a chart. And uh, and they lay it out and they, they tell you your past life. One of your significant path, past lives that ties into some of the things that are happening to you in this mm -hmm. lifetime. And then they tell you your worst sin from your past life ever. Does a guru have made him ask that question? Mm -hmm. After, I go, really? Because I saw people coming out of the room crying. Oh, they, <laughs> they burned somebody at the stake or they, you know, beheaded yeah. somebody. Okay. And I go, the worst sin ever? I said, okay. So anyway, so they go back to a lifetime that connects with, people and things that are happening in the now lifetime. And it was in Sri Lanka where I was at an ashram and I was a senior monk there. And, and uh, my worst sin ever was uh, I fell in love with a woman, didn't do anything, but just had a thought, geez, I love her. She's beautiful. That was it. That was my worst sin that whole entire lifetime. And I'm going for real <laughs> kicked out of the ashram cursed. And anyway, <laughs> And so, I, so I wandered away, and then years and years later, along the Ganges River, I'm bathing in the river. I come up out of the Ganges River, and there's Lord Shiva. Boom. I'm, I'm transferred into a rainbow body of light, and I leave the body. And then they go, every lifetime they can look back on for at least 20, 25 lifetimes, I've always left in a rainbow body. Wow. But then I come back by choice. And then at the end of life, remember what I was there for and the purpose. And then anyway, that's the whole thing. But that's that leads into uh, my third near death experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I know you wanted to talk about those. So yes, please. Uh, yeah. But 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 that I just want to give you an idea of there's out of body experiences. Mm -hmm. There's rainbow body experiences. There's double body experiences. Yeah near-death experiences. I kind of put that in the same category. Near-death experiences are not a rare phenomenon at all. Mm. They happen to everybody, even like people named Linda. I mean, everybody's had a near-death experience after a while. <laughs> people I know, I go, come on, what do you do for an encore, right? So uh, it's not your time to go. It's not your time to go. And I tell people that a lot. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to live anymore. No, you didn't have a choice. You didn't make a choice to come back or not come back. You didn't have a choice. I'm sorry. Hmm. You are kicked out of the house. It's you've grown <laughs> up. They kicked you out. Your parents just locked the door. <laughs> and then, you can't come home yet. No, nope, you haven't lived your life yet. Anyway. That's exactly how I felt at mine, darling. They they told me I had to go back, and it was go back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Any, I don't know anybody that voluntarily goes. Damn. I want to, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I want to go back. Please kick me out of here. No, I've met nobody. That, I met absolutely nobody. And I know probably 1,500 or 1,800 people have near-death experiences. And not one person I ever talked to said, yeah, I, I wanted to get the hell out of heaven. <laughs> right away. I, I wanted to get back in that stinking, hurting body laying there. You know, yeah. that's it. I, want, I wanted to reunite with that rotting flesh. <laughs> no, not one person ever uttered those words. But see, at eight years old, I went to the hospital <laughs> and uh, I was literally fatally, deathly sick. They told my parents probably wasn't going to survive. I had lung disease, kidney disease, uh, all kinds of diseases all at once. And uh, so when I, when I went in the hospital, uh, the first night I was put in isolation by myself. First time eight years old by myself away from home. Yeah. And I'm in a room. They turn the lights off after doing some stuff, puncturing my lungs. And I laid there in a total dark room. And 
I'm gone. All of a sudden, I'm light. You know, I feel you're light. It's like yes. the weight of the body's gone. And you know you're floating. And you look down in a total, total dark room, yet you see your body. You see a body down there. And, and your mind, even at eight years old, says, that's the shell of me. That's the body. But that is not me. Because mm. I am this consciousness watching and observing that. I yeah. mean, you know that. I mean, nobody has to tell you that. You know that's not you. Yes. It's just the body. It's just the ego yes. uh, clothing. So I'm floating up above. And of course, at eight years old, there's not going to be any life review. What are you going to review? You didn't share your toys. Shame <laughs> on you. I mean, come on. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know like come on. All right. Yeah. All right. So I had which I'm finding is unusual because I haven't met anybody else has had it. But instead of going backwards in my life, I went forward as it turned out 50 years forward. Mm -hmm. I was eight and a half years old and I went through 50, 58 and a half years old. So I went through that 50 year period and uh, I saw everything that was going to happen to me and all the, all the major things were going to happen in my life to Vietnam war helicopters didn't yeah. Huey wasn't even developed and the Huey helicopter, nobody wasn't even made yeah. yet. Yeah. Uh, saw Kennedy's assassination, didn't know who he was. Uh, I mean, I saw all these, I saw my wife who I was going to marry. I saw my children. I saw, so my next 50 years was kind of like deja vu every, every week. You know, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Big deal. So, so anyway, making it real short on that because it's your typical near-death experience with 50-year pre-life review. Some typical, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, so during this during this uh, life review, I I'm looking at these clouds, and, and these images are just like a giant screen. You know, it's like a television screen. All these things are coming. I'm watching the war. I'm watching this. I'm watching mm -hmm. that. Which houses I own and buy. But in the middle of that, there, there was two numbers that kept flipping. They were kind of like big numbers, a 29, and then the two would flip. And if you flip a two upside down, it looks like a five. Yeah. Two, five. So it looked like 29, 59, 29, 59. I go, what in the world is this, right? So at the time, I thought, am I going to die at 29 or 59 or something major going to happen? I didn't know. Later on, somebody told me about Saturn. You know, Saturn comes 29 years and 59 years. You know, it's like like a, a it's like a, a karmic death. I mean, you get rid of your old life, your old ways. You, you kind of yeah. change directions. And anyway, so I didn't know about any of that. But when I went to India, first trip to India in 2004, I went to Babaji's cave, which is a cave. If you read Autobiography of a Yogi. It's a cave where this great enlightened master, Larry Masha, mm -hmm. he uh, met his guru, uh, Babaji, this mm -hmm. ageless avatar that there's no real record of or nobody knows who, what he is. Uh, of course, later on, when I went back to India and talked to people, they'll tell me that he's been sincere since the beginning of time. Some other people say, well, he's an avatar and he, you know, he went up and. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I've researched him and I understand what you're saying there. Yeah. yeah there's because, people, because, different stories and stuff. Yeah. But to me, I wanted to go to Babaji's cave when I was in that hospital for one year, total best rest. One year, I couldn't get out of bed. No toys, no television, no radio, no coloring books, no kids to play with, nothing. Yeah. Uh, I I thought about Babaji's cave and that's where I wanted to go. And then once I was 58 and a half going on 59, I finally, <laughs> I finally ended up in India. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm hiking to the cave and there, there's no guides. I, it's a long story on this one. But, but anyway, I get to Babaji's cave. A lot of beautiful spiritual things happen. On the way back down, I have a heart attack. I pass out. I fall off a 30 foot cliff up in the Himalayas, and I land on a big boulder down below. 
Yeah. And I'm laying there looking up at the sky and pretty soon it's like the sky is just, I'm up in the clouds. It's like, whoa. So I look down and there's that old broken up body laying there. And I'm thinking, hey, I've been here before. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's not me. And uh, okay. I'm almost, I'm almost 59. Maybe this is the time to go. And I've been to Babaji's cave. It's all cool. Yeah. So I'm enjoying myself watching it. My buddy's on the cliff looking down at my body. <laughs> kind of like, oh, and I'm <laughs> just having a good time floating above. And Bruce and I look down there and I see this very, very large cobra snake crawling across my feet. And I love snakes. I mean, I just cobra being a cobra, just yeah. something special. And instead of getting, and I get excited. It's like, I don't know if they got these, in, what, what you call them in, in, in Australia, but up here, you got these, what they call defibrillators, the yes. firemen and stuff. Yep. And you go, chunk, you know, yep. you get a job. Anyway, we have like, them, yeah. All right, so there I am watching this, and it was like, there's my body, no breathing, no pulse, no life laying there. And it was like when the snake came over, it was like the snake was a defibrillator. It was like, clear, boom, and I just <laughs> jumped up, right? And I started grabbing the snake, and I'm grabbing the snake like this. In, in the middle of its body and my fingers they're not touching like this they're not going all the way around they're like this meaning the body was still going that part right yeah up and it was bigger than that right and i'm trying to grab it and we're talking about a real snake real teeth real <laughs> and i'm chasing it through the grass uh anyway so long story short i survived the snake doesn't bite me beautiful things happen but it leads me to my third near-death experience because I, I told you about the naughty palm leaf reading. Yes. That's where I was going to get you to hear. Mm -hmm. So in that reading, I was told several things were going to happen to me. One, that the following year uh, that I would uh, go to this temple, Shiva temple in Southern India. And, uh, and I would go there. And then when I got there, it'd be a hill. And I'd walk uphill two to four hours, just wandering up this hill. And when I got to the top of the hill, there'd be a clearing and on some rocks and some logs around a fire, a sacred fire, where all the rishis, remember the rishis, the guy that wrote the things? Mm -hmm. There's 18 rishis, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I told, I, I, would, I would walk up there, they'd be waiting for me. And they wouldn't teach me anything or, or answer any questions because when I got there, I already know everything I wanted to ask. It would just be oh. awakened. Mm. It was just like, oh, I already know all this stuff, right? So that's, and I thought that's a crazy prediction. Yeah, I thought, yeah, great. That's a crazy prediction. Yeah. And another crazy one was Lord Shiva and the guys of Babaji or whoever would be standing over me, dropping oil and water on my head and and blessing me, and I thought, that's really stupid, too. So I had these stupid predictions. I thought, yeah, okay. So I wasn't buying into it. So anyway, so I go to India in 2011. I have a major heart attack. I'm sent home. I collapse at the airport in customs coming back to America. I end up in a hospital in Sacramento, four days intensive care. And then they take me in for quadruple bypass surgery. They rip my chest open and, you know, they put me on a heart and lung machine so you're not breathing. So I'm, I'm laying on the table and I'm naked, butt naked. Sorry. I mean, just, and it, it's a metal table and it's about 40 degrees or 42 degrees or some crazy low temperature inside. Yeah. They don't want it warm to create germs and bacteria, right? From blood and stuff. Yeah. So it's cold. They all got jackets on with their things over it. And uh, so I'm laying there on that. They just got a thin, thin sheet on there between me and the other one. I get the table dirty. It wasn't for my comfort. It's just <laughs> protecting the cleanliness of the table. I go, what? Anyway, so I'm there and he goes, he says, you got any questions? You haven't told me nothing, right? And I go, well, <laughs> what are you going to actually do? He says, and then great bedside manner, right? He says, well, I'm going to take and cut your chest open. I'm going oh to go over the with a chest spreader and he shows me. He says, and, and then he says, and then I'm gonna rip out arteries in your arms and legs, and we're gonna use those to, to, to transfer the blood. 
They're going to create new, you know, vessels. <laughs> and he says, and while that's happening, he says, I'm going to stop your heart and I'm going to stop your lungs and I'll put you on a heart lung machine. And I looked at him, I said, you mean my heart's not beating? He goes, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not breathing? Yeah. I said, isn't that the definition of death? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we're going to kill you. That's what he <laughs> said. <laughs> yeah, we're going to kill you. And I'm going, really? That's oh, just my God. <laughs> He says, well, as long as, long as we got power. <laughs> so I'm thinking really good. I said, well, I said, I got one more question. I said, am I going to feel anything? You know, because I'm on this heart lung machine, you know? Yeah. He says, well, he says, unfortunately, we're in a heart lung machine. He says about 95% of the people don't feel anything. Okay. I go, I go meaning? He says, well, 5% of the people feel everything. Oh, go, no. Oh, well, okay, fine. He says, because we can't give you as much. Anesthesia working on this machine. Yeah. It's only about 5%. All right. You're so the thinking, 5%. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, so oh my God. he knocks me out. And as soon as I'm knocked out, boom, blackness to boom, I'm standing in India. And I knew it was India because all these Indians were on me. And the only thought I have in my mind is I'm standing there in the heat in this temple courtyard. Uh, my only thought was, do I have clothes on? <laughs> I, was like, I was thinking when I started this experience, right? That you're, you're having this metaphysical experience. What's my yes. first thought? Am I naked? Do I have clothes yeah. on? And I'm looking down. Oh, I got clothes on, right? So oh, thank anyway, goodness so, for that. <laughs> no, I, I travel. I travel close. So it was really an odd thing to be thinking, but that was my thought, right? <laughs> so and people bump it into me, and I feel people, and I feel the heat, and I look at the temple. And I knew this is the temple they were talking about. I could see the bull outside, you know, the temple doors. I knew it was a Shiva temple. And I go and I look, there's a little hill. I said, well, I got eight hours of surgery. I might as well walk uphill, right? Yeah. So here I am, here I am in a body, not an astral body attached to a cord, not an out-of-body experience. And the other way, it's not a rainbow body experience. It's not a near-death experience where boom, I'm in heaven, I'm talking, you know, none of those. I'm in a physical body while my other physical body is laying on the operating table. Yeah. And while I'm walking uphill, I could feel hands and instruments kind of move around inside my body, right? Which was, I said, okay, they got an operation going on. So I was well aware of being operated on. But I'm walking around this, this body. I walk uphill. I finally get to the top of the hill. Uh, top of the hill, just like the prediction, there's these 18 rishis plus one. Oh. The guru that sent me for the reading. Yeah. He was there. And, uh, and I walk up there and I sit down next to the fire, a sacred fire. And I didn't have one question for anybody. I, uh, it was a good time for you to ask me a question. Had you been there? You should have been there to interview me. I could have <laughs> answered any question. I could have told you about anything you wanted. But, you know, it was one of those things that when it's done, you don't remember, right? That's so, right. Yeah. Well, I, knew everything, I knew everything when I was supposed to know everything. There I was. And, and then the guru was there. The guy that sent me to the mm -hmm. to the reading, yeah. he goes, he goes, beer. He says you could skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. So he kept saying that to me, and I'm going, what the heck's going? Because honestly, I was in such bad shape, I was in such great pain that I felt, hey, look, hey, if it, if it's not, if I don't make it, I'm I'm, I'm not losing anything. I mean, I love yeah. my wife, kids, but this this body's shot. It's really bad. And uh, so all of a sudden, there's this cloud, the cloud like I saw when I was eight years old, right? Yeah. Ooh, there it was, right? So, wow. and all of a sudden, there's a voice coming from the cloud. And it's a beautiful woman, sound like about a 20 some year old woman, an old lady, very feminine sounding. And she goes, Bill, you've done everything you're supposed to do, you owe no, nothing to anybody. You've done your job. Come with me. Just give up your heart. Just, just give it up. Come. I promise you bliss, love, comfort, joy. You know, it's all here for you. We're waiting for you. And I go, wow, this is really cool, right? So, and then the guru keeps shaking his head and he goes, no, no, don't give apart. You, know, you can skip a few beats, uh, don't get it. Yeah. I go, what? I go, well, what do you offer? And he says, 
I'm offering more pain, more suffering than you ever had in your life. <laughs> and I go, is this your sales pitch? Yeah, wow. <laughs> Are you going to give me more pain, more suffering than I ever had? He says, up till now, you've overcome pain because I used to get to go to the dentist. I, could dr- I never had the shots. Don't give me a shot. Just drill down the nerve. It's no yeah. big deal. It was terrible for the dentist because they would do this. You know, they're drilling. They were in more pain than I was. Yeah. <laughs> no, right? Anyway, there's no more yoga magic. I mean, you're going to feel everything because you have to you have to learn to handle pain so you can teach other people how to handle pain. I go. I said, so she's promised me bliss. Come, <laughs> and you promised me come back and suffer pain. And yes, yes. And I go, and why should I do that? So, <laughs> So then it does this, and all these clouds turns out to be all these sea of faces, just faces, old yeah. people, young people, infants, uh, dogs, cats, yeah. all sorts of people, black, yellow, white, you know, Australians and, you know, and Californians and, you know, <laughs> BPs and I mean, and you name it, right? It was all kinds of people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And, and then he just goes, if you don't come back, you don't owe these people nothing. But if you don't come back, all these people will be missing what gift you could give them. It might be wow. a smile. It might be saving their life. They may be suicidal. You might inspire them. You yes. might get them to meditate. You might heal them. Mm. You might just cheer them up one day. You don't know. Each one has a different gift that you're going to give them. And I'm going, that's the best you can do. It's more pain. So while I'm going through this argument, all of a sudden, remember, remember the paddles? Click, click. They revived me on the operating table with a couple of paddles, you know, on the heart. And so all of a sudden I'm on this hilltop and it's like, oh, and boom. And now I'm on this cold, ice cold table naked. Right? <laughs> and I got a tube down my throat and for oxygen. I got my eyes closed, uh, shut, yeah. you know, tape. Yep, tape, yeah. And I think I had tape over my ears. I don't know why, but it, it, it was hard to figure out. Yeah. But I was strapped down, and they're not through a surgery. They just restarted behind. They still got to connect the rib cage. They got to sew that oh. up. <laughs> they got to get, and I hear the doctor say, the anesthesia says, hey, I think, I think this guy's waking up. I don't think the anesthesia is working. And the other doctor goes, Hell, we only got another 20 to 40 minutes. Let's just finish it. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going, I'm wide awake hearing this. Oh, my God. I don't understand what's going I'm going, <laughs> in my mind, I'm going, hey, guys, I feel everything. <laughs> so, anyway, so that started. Oh, my God. Bill. Anyway, so I was there for weeks in the hospital, which is unusual for heart surgery. Usually four days in America, they kick you out. Yeah. Uh, weeks. But the last couple of nights before I left, they were taking me down for, I had five blood transfusions and, and they were taking me downstairs for emergency procedures because I was just not, do, I was dying. I wasn't doing good at all. And I wasn't helping any because I was like, God, take me. You know? <laughs> and uh, so the phone rings about 1130 at night. And I tell the guy, doctor, I, I got to answer this. He says, no, no, we got you on a gurney. We're taking you down for this emergency procedure. I said, I got to answer that. So I pick it up and I hear this voice. B, this is Gornoff from India. And I go, well, how many Gornoffs do I know? That I mean, had to narrow down. I mean, I only know one. Come on. So, and he goes, and the next thing he says is, he says, don't give up heart. You can skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. Wow. And I'm going, What? 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 And, and then he goes, if that wasn't enough, then he goes, he says, I just told a hundred people here at the ashram. I sent them up to the temple to pray because I told them that I was going to heal you. He says, don't embarrass me. In other words, don't die. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> yeah. What? Well, what? So then I decided I better get the hell out of the hospital. I didn't want to embarrass this poor guru. He just told everybody he was going to save me. <laughs> and if I died, he'd look bad. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, so I got it. I'm going to leave the next day. And I'm laying in bed. Remember the other prediction about the oil and the water on my head from Babaji? Yeah. I'm laying in bed and it's like a dome of light over me, like a crystal bowl over me with electricity going. 
And I look at the end of the bed and there's Babaji, long black hair, no shirt. Except this is in America and it's my world, right? Yes. He's got, Levi's, he's got Levi's on, but he's barefoot. And he's reaching all the way from the end of the bed, which has got to be about seven, eight feet away, right? And and he's and he's reaching over to uh, anoint my head with oil and water. And at the time, I'm thinking, well, this is odd because his arms are coming all the way over here. Yeah. And his body's at the other end of the bed, right? But like, so I'm thinking, well, this is I'm delusional. This is a good delusion to have. I was feeling blissful. Yeah. This is cool. <laughs> I said, everybody's gonna think I'm crazy. Nobody's gonna believe me. I said, but uh, let's enjoy it. So I figured, okay. So I enjoyed it, went on for a long period. He, he chanted and did this stuff, and I was feeling really blissed out. So I come home from the hospital the next day, and my daughter, adult daughter, she comes over to my house, goes, Dad, did you see David? He's you know, our old neighbor. He says, uh, David went to visit you on your last day in the hospital. Yeah. I said, no, no, he didn't. He says, oh, yeah, he said he was there. I said, oh, I didn't see him. He said, well, he came into the room. He says, and you had some crazy young Indian guy with no shirt and shoes on oh. there, pouring stuff on your head, chanting some crazy language. And he started to laugh and he was embarrassed for you. So he left. How so amazing I, is that? Oh my I mean, God. I mean, having the experience was good, but to have somebody else see and verify the experience. Absolutely. I was a non believer. That was like, yes. yeah, that's cool. Oh but, yes. So, so that was that was my three uh, near death. But let me tell you, the second one I skipped over important part. When I come home from that second near death experience, I was in India a couple months, and being a typical man, you don't run to the doctor. Like yeah. I just had a heart attack. I should go get checked up. No, I didn't. Yeah. And I'm like in November. Uh, in December, I went to the doctor because my forehead. Uh, I had this big cancerous tumor grow. I went to India looking for this guru experience. And I come back and I got cancer in my spiritual eye. I thought it was so cool. Cut it out. I had stitches there. It was really cool looking. I thought it was crazy. But anyway, but I was having heart attacks and I didn't tell anybody. The next month, I finally collapsed in my garage about the sixth time. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I should go drive to the hospital. So I, I drive to the hospital. I drive myself to the hospital having a full-blown heart attack. Find a place to park. Walk to the ER. Get in there, stand in a line of people, because I didn't go in with the ambulances. I went with the yeah. people walk in. 18 people in front of me. I know because I counted them. Yeah. 18 people in front of me. And I'm having a heart attack. I get up there to have me a clipboard, fill out of this stuff, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, what's the first question they asked me? Not what's wrong with you. What was the first question they asked me when I walked in the hospital? Do you have insurance? Yes. That was the first question. Very first you, question. I, yes. First question. Do you have, I said, yes, I have right here at the side. Okay, great. So they give me a clipboard. Yes. I fill it out. I get in another line. There's about five or six people. I finally get to this nurse. She takes the clipboard and on the clipboard says, why are you here? And I put down, I'm having a full-blown heart attack. And she laughs. She goes, she says, how'd you get here? And so I drove myself. She goes, yeah. And, and you parked. Yeah, yeah. And you wait in that line. Yeah, and did you wait this line? Yeah, and you're having a full blown heart attack. I go, yeah, yeah. She goes, I'll be the judge of that. She goes, sit down. She takes her stethoscope out, puts it in, and she goes, you're, and she's pushing a button. Some blue yeah. lights go off. And everything. The wheelchair gurney's coming over. More people go, <laughs> sure, you really have a heart attack. And I said, very calmly, I go, yeah, that's why I came in. She says, no, you really have a heart attack. I said, no, really, I know that. That's why I came in. <laughs> So I go to the doctor, and of course, he wants to do surgery right away. And I'm going, nah, I got things going this weekend. I mean, I had a lecture I was doing. So, no, no, you need. And, and I said, look, and so I started complaining. I said, I said, what kind of deal is this? So I'm vegetarian. Uh, uh, I meditate. I don't drink alcohol. I don't do cigarettes. I don't do caffeine. Uh, I don't do nothing. I don't eat meat. I mean, I, I lead a clean life. And he looks at me, remember that 29? 59. Yeah. He goes, he says, based on what I gather from your genetics, he says, had you not been doing that, you'd probably been dead at 29 instead of two or three weeks before your 59th birthday. Ah. So I'm going, oh. 
So had I not, the day I got out of the hospital after my first near-death experience, I got out of the hospital after a year, what did I do? I became a vegetarian. The only one in my family to be a vegetarian. I just said, for some reason I knew when I had this life review that I needed to, I didn't know why, but I, I needed to change my diet. Yeah. And I changed my diet and I didn't get into alcohol or drugs or none of this stuff. I avoided all that. Yeah. And to show you how, how astrology works, I had a friend who was born the same day as me, same hospital. Wow. His brother and my mother were, you know, sharing a room together, right? Yeah. And we were in bassinets next to each other. We we're both Irish. We were both juniors. He was named after his father. I was named after my father, both juniors, both Irishmen, both had a middle name started with H, you know, whatever his was, and mine was Hector. Yeah. And, but we we met then, but we didn't know about that until I moved away about 40, 50 miles away. And so did he. And in the fourth grade, we celebrated talking about birthdays in the classroom. And, oh, it's my birthday. Oh, my birthday. Where are you born? San Francisco. We started talking, found out we were born in the same hospital within an hour or two of each other. All right. So I thought, well, if there's anything to astrology, what happened to this guy? Because this guy was a meat eater, drank real heavy, smoked. Yeah. Did, as uh, far as I know, he probably did drugs. I mean, his lifestyle wasn't clean, didn't exercise, <laughs> nothing, right? Yeah. And so I, I talked to people in my class because we had a class reunion coming. They go, who do you want to meet most? And I put down his name, you know. And they go, well, he passed away, Bill. So he died and didn't make 59. So it shows you if you follow the star charts, Born at that time in that place, that was the destiny. 59, you're dead. Yeah. But at 28, things happened to me, and I didn't die because I changed my diet. But I, I've kind of felt when I got to be at 28, that was kind of like a, yeah. a death I avoided. And then going on 59 was a death I avoided. And uh, so anyway, so that was the three near-death experiences. Wow. It's totally different than probably other people talk about on this show. Yeah. I could I could probably spend an hour to two on each one, but that just kind of gives you a, a wrap. Yes. Uh, so you can see the cosmic flow of the energy world. Absolutely. So and that's gotten me to where I'm at today, which maybe on our next interview we can talk about what I'm doing now. Absolutely, Bill. I'd love to have you as a guest again. So maybe in a few weeks we can organize one where you tell me about all your healing and all the other things that you're going on with now, that'd be amazing to do that with you. I'd love to organize that. That's yeah. me six, six months ago. 300, over 300 stitches in this face, 14, 15 surgeries. I lost track in two years. Nose cut off twice, nostril cut off again. Whole entire forehead was removed. Big, huge things taken out of here, there. A uh, huge hole up here. Uh, yet I use these healing techniques that I've learned. And here I am, going to be 77 in uh, less than four weeks. March You're 16. a March baby too. I'm a March baby. Yes. There you go. So we you will, uh, we're, we're going to survive. But uh, yes, I, I've learned a lot. Uh, and it wasn't from the near death experiences. People go, oh, near death experience changed my life. I can honestly say, no, it was another, it was another feather in a bag of feathers, but it was a, it wasn't the catalyst. I am me. That was me when I was two or three years old. Yes. And all these things happen were just part of my journey. Mm -hmm. None of them dramatically changed or shift directions. It was always the boat was on course. I mean, I hate to say that, but it was like. I've been psychic. I've been doing these things. I've had all kinds of experiences and um, documented stuff. I've even been I've been investigated by the CIA when I was in the army. Wow! I found out I got a file. Yeah, because I was predicting things that you can't do that anyway. They came <laughs> 40, forty something years later, tried to get me to teach them to to do that. They thought they could do it with engineering. I go, no, you can't do this with a machine. You can't do it with a computer. Yeah something else yeah. anyway so well, that would be something else that we can talk about on another show bill because i would love to have you back um definitely you know i want to hear more about i'm sure that 
people need to hear your stories and that's why you're here. Um, so thank you so much. I've got your links to your books. Thank you. I'm going to put all the links in below for anyone who wants to hear these today. I've also got all Bill's links there in the description below if you do want to go and um, check out Bill's website. I've also got some photos that I've shared. Anything else that you want to say today, Bill? All right, let's talk about Australia because I'm coming. Yes! Uh, the only thing I lack, I mean, I could be there as early as this summer or next summer or whatever. Uh, I just need people over there that can get places and venues I could use. Uh, yeah and help me with logistics of setting something up over there. So but, uh, when, I'm coming to Australia. Yeah. Australia, there's a hunger down there for what I'm doing. There's a yes. real that's crying out. I hear it. I feel it. I sense it. Yes. New Zealand, maybe, but Australia, definitely. Um, and, and so I'm going to be there. And uh, How many people are you looking at to have at each gathering that you have here, Bill? What are you um, perceiving there? Here's, here's, what, here's what I'm really looking for. I'm really looking for people that, that carry on what I'm doing in this practice of healing and teaching people self-healing. I would really like to, instead of working with masses of thousands of people trying to, you know, each individual, I'd rather teach teachers, people that want to do this and, and then get them and have them take a course and get certified and everything, of course. But I... I, I Another 13 years, I'll be 90 years old, and it's well past my expiration date, seriously. Um, yeah. So I, I need to replace me by taking everything I've learned in 77 years and replicate it in other people. In other words, here's what I've learned. Just open your mind, open your heart. Don't ask a lot of questions. Focus on what I'm telling you. Accept it as this and start where I'm leaving off. You don't have to go through all the stuff I went through. You know, just do this. Yes. So I want I want people to uh, to become teachers so they can teach people to self-heal. And then I'm looking for a specialized group of people that are, uh, I think we talked about this earlier, that are chiropractors, acupuncturists, uh, mm. podiatry, uh, uh, holistic medicine, whatever they're doing. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to get them to the uh, practitioner level so they can actually perform this. Mm. And so two different levels. People are going to teach people self-healing and people are going to own it a little bit better. They're going to actually take on the role of the healer yes. a little bit more. So I don't want to leave this world after all I've learned and not have it on a video, written down, taught to people. Yes. So I would like to definitely, when I get to Australia, We'll do some events, but I'd also have some events for these people that want to do it. I'm going to let people self-nominate themselves. They think they, they got the abilities. Uh, and then I'm going to develop a training program. I, I got to meet them, though, first. I, yes. I need to know. I don't want people to go out and think they're God. They're healing people because you're not. Only God heals. And it, it basically, whatever, the best thing you can do is awaken this, the God within the person to heal themselves. Mm -hmm. And when you recognize that you're not the healer, then that's the kind of people I want to work with. Yeah. You may facilitate it, but it's like saying the waiter bringing you the food that the cook made, uh, it gets credit for the great food. No, he just bring it to your table to eat. Yeah. You can thank the waiter all you want, but he didn't cook the food. God made this food. That's right. God, and he gave it to you and you consumed it. The waiter is just the conveyance yes. between the two points. So what I'm trying to get is teach people to become the, the pipe, the conduit the flow between the ultimate energy love mm. and the person. Yeah. And so there's ways to do that. So what I do when I do my workshops is I try to elevate the frequency and the vibration of the people that come and charge their batteries. So they're able to do this on their own. I don't want people going out trying to kill people. No, heal yourself to mm. change the whole world. Heal yourself. Yes. That's huge. Yes. Absolutely. So, well, I'm going to do all I can to help this succeed for you, Bill, because well, that's... Have, people, have people contact you, have them contact me. But if somebody could put something together, a couple of places I could talk, yeah. you know, bring a few dozen people and... Uh, Absolutely. We, Absolutely. We 
because ultimately, you know, I believe that we're all here to do work for the source, heaven, God, any deity that you want to call it. But as long as we all have that belief that there is something there and we want to do that work for them as well as us because we are all one, ultimately, as you said at the beginning, you know, that's how we make this magic occur in the planet. This is how we're going to heal the whole planet, not just our human race. I'm talking animals, plant life, the soil, the earth itself. Um, you know, it all starts with one energetic spark and it can ripple around the planet. So thank you so much for wanting to be a part of that, Bill. I cannot thank you enough. We're evolving as a, a, a race. Uh, the Indians in India talk about this as being the fifth root race. In other words, we've had this is the fifth time, you know, the planet was destroyed by fire, flood, ice, you know, yeah. whatever, right? Um, so we're evolving species, which gets another whole show. Yeah. How do we evolve? Yeah. Was Noah's Ark, was it really dealing with DNA? Is it somebody from was the ark a, a spaceship? What oh. was it? What was going on? So yeah. it's um, another whole debate. That's right. All well, right. I Thank think you. We'll, I'll leave it there today. Thank you so much. And I look forward to talking to you again. So thank you, Reverend Bill McDonald, for being here today. Thank you so much.